sweets, only ripe vegetables, fresh fruit and whole wheat. I'm from the old school. My household smell like soul food, bro. Curry falafel. Welcome to the very first episode of The Bearded Vegans. My name is Paul. My name is Andy. And we are The Bearded Vegans. This is a podcast where we talk about vegan news, reviews, and have a dissection of other vegan and social justice issues. Uh, for this very first episode, we're going to first start out by talking a little bit about ourselves, and then we're going to go into uh, the issue of Cecil the Lion. That's kind of been a hot issue, especially in the vegan community and just in the the general community too, I'd say. And then we're going to finish off with a, a little review of our top five uh, vegan restaurants in Connecticut, where we both currently live. So yeah, let's start off with a little bit about ourselves. Andy, would you like to go first? Oh, sure. Uh, so my name's Andy Tabar, and uh, I've been vegan for close to eight years now. Um, I've you know tried my hat as a vegan activist. I've toured extensively on the 10 Billion Lives Tour, uh, which is a project of the farm animal rights movement. And uh, more people would probably know me as uh, the face of Compassion Company, which is uh, an organic USA-made vegan clothing line. And I've been running that for about four years. And that takes me all over the country to various veg fest and animal rights conferences. And uh, that's pretty much me in a nutshell. My, uh, my name is Paul. Uh, my vegan resume is much less uh, extensive uh, than Andy's. But I've been vegan for about six years at this point. Um, I've, I've done some, some volunteer work. I usually help out Andy sometimes with the Compassion Company stuff at VegFests. Um, I've gotten a couple articles published in some uh, Connecticut newspapers about trying Meatless Mondays or trying to get uh, more meatless options in schools. I am currently a high school math teacher, uh, so that's why I have the kind of passion about education. And um, I've recently I've helped out with some uh, – with the – the 10 billion lives tour when uh when we were rocking out at the mayhem fest uh so bringing vegan to the to the metals uh yeah so that's a little bit about ourselves um our first issue uh like we mentioned is going to be about cecil the lion so andy did you want to give a quick review that's and it's a it's a pretty it's a pretty hot issue right now but just in case um you haven't heard about it yeah, I, I would imagine it'd be almost impossible to not have heard about it. It's certainly flooding my Facebook feed. I'm sure it's flooding yours as well. Um, obviously, uh, vegans are upset about it, but also the it seems to have captured the attention of the general public uh, in a way that's uh, almost unexpected. Um, the rundown is basically um, Cecil the Lion uh, was recently killed by Dr. Walter Palmer, who is a dentist from Minnesota, and uh, he is a trophy hunter. Hunter has a lot of kills under his belt, apparently. And um, it became known that Cecil was sort of lured off of his uh, reserve or nature reserve in Zimbabwe um, and was then, you know, killed by a bow, uh, bow and arrow from uh, Dr. Palmer, and then supposedly uh, lived for about 40 hours while the hunters were tracking him down and then shot him with a gun. And then he was skinned and beheaded. So clearly a, a fairly brutal death for the animal. Um, and I think what makes this uh, remarkable and worth talking about is the backlash that uh, Dr. Palmer has received in the wake of uh, the public finding out about this issue. Uh, reading from CNN.com, um, Dr. Palmer has gone into hiding. It appears the Internet world was at his doorstep with pitchforks and torches. The website for the dental practice is no longer available online. Online reviews are trashing his business. The hashtag Walter Palmer is being used to pepper him with threats and insults. And the Facebook page called Shame Lion Killer Dr. Walter Palmer and River, River Bluff Dental, which is his uh, dental practice, is 73,000 members strong. Uh, so it's it's been quite a ferocious backlash and uh one of the pictures accompanying this story is a photo of the front door of his dental practice which has a collection of uh stuffed animals uh you know lions tigers uh no bears um <laughs> and uh a, a drawing someone said dr palmer why did you kill cecil and uh most prominently featured is a giant neon yellow sign with the let the words rot in hell posted on the door 
and uh, the the dental practice has been shuttered. So that's sort of what's going on with this issue. Um, and I think it's also it's also important to point out that a lot of this backlash is coming from from non vegans or vegetarians as well, which is what makes it, I think, a, a pretty interesting issue. Um, it reminds me of the the issue with the, also pretty recently with like the dog killings um, and how that kind of there was a lot of was that in uh, the U- the Yulin Dog Festival yeah yeah and um, and how that as well got a lot of backlash from from vegans and and interestingly non vegans so we kind of just wanted to um, dissect that a little bit about how there's there's it's it's obviously a an animal rights issue it's an animal issue but it's it's um a lot of non-vegans are taking interest in it so we wanted to look at that a little bit and then also uh another interesting thing that's come in response to the Cecil the lion issue is that i've also seen a lot of posts on facebook about people saying like oh what you can't like why do you care so much about this lion when there's these other ish, there's issue x y and z also happening in the united states or somewhere else in the world and and like you you're caring too much about this issue so i wanted to talk a little bit about um like intersectionality and and the idea that you can or cannot care about too many or too few issues yeah it's certainly a lot to unpack with this issue. Uh, I think a good place to start is that um, the disconnect between why do certain animal issues capture the eye of the public, like Cecil the Lion and like the Yulin Dog Festival, um, while uh, there's other you know huge animal issues happening you know right here at our own doorstep that receive little to no attention. Yeah, and, and definitely the in like the animal industry the. Because the, the the CNN article that Andy was just reading, it points out like the gruesomeness of the skinning and the beheading and those those sorts of things, and that that kind of stuff is happening every day to a to the extent of billions of animals every year, and um, and it's it's just interesting that that people just care about like the line, and I mean um, it's. It, it, like if this happened to a cow or something like that, people wouldn't. A lot of people wouldn't wouldn't even bat an eye about it. It's interesting. I think it, maybe if it happened to a cow, um, you know, and that like specific story was highlighted, um, there might be some public outcry over it. Uh, just like whenever a cow escapes from uh, a slaughterhouse or a transport truck, uh, and all of a sudden, you know, people, the empathy for that cow is in the public eye, and people root for that cow to escape because we know the faith that's going to await it yeah. or await that cow. Um, yet, you know, when it happens to billions, when it's institutionalized uh, and it becomes, you know, our, our dinner, people don't seem to bat an eye at it. Yeah, and, and I think um, that's an important. An important key to animal activism is that, like Andy was just saying, once you make something personal for someone, once you give give an animal a name or once you give it a, if a face even, it, it makes it harder for a lot of people, definitely not everybody, but it makes a lot of, it harder for a lot of people to see that animal than be killed or even be served to them as food. Um, and I think that's, that's a good uh, – that's an important uh, fact – to keep in mind when you're trying to promote uh, animal issues to non-vegans or non-vegetarians, and you, I think, I think it's important to try to to get them to to, to kind of personalize it for them and, and make it um, make them think about the fact that each time that they're eating meat, they're supporting this industry that is killing act- real actual animals. It's not just some. It's not just something that you can. Um, I don't know. I'm I'm kind of rambling at this point, but <laughs> but I think that a lot of people get away with well it's for themselves they get away with eating meat because they just they they've for lack of better words they've dehumanized it and they've um, they just don't think about each individual animal that's being killed they just kind of think about it like oh it happens I'm not going to think about it and and once you kind of personalize it for them it it makes it more real. Yeah, and I think that's a, a strategy that we're starting to see a lot of the the larger animal rights organizations uh, do is in their their leaflets and uh, videos is giving names to animals and telling their personal story. 
Um, so certainly that has you know an impact on why people care so much about this one particular lion. Um, Cecil, like it's Cecil. It, yeah, it, it, like he it has a a name, and it's I think yeah, it's definitely yeah. and uh, some of the response. I guess we can talk about appropriate response and inappropriate response to this from vegans and non vegans. Mm-hmm. Um, I think one of the the better responses I've seen have been groups or people making images of like a pig or a cow that say, "What if my name was Cecil?" And hopefully that gets people thinking about it. Um, you know, we can only hope. I know there's certainly there's a lot of disconnect there, and it's really hard for people to make that hurdle. And, and certainly yeah. for vegans, it's I've seen a lot of evidence of this on my Facebook feed of people are very frustrated that people care so much about this one lion, um, yet don't care about the animals on their plate. Um, I think that, uh, you know, people are outraged that it took 40 hours for Cecil to die and beheading and skinning all that stuff. And as Paul said, that stuff happens regularly, uh, in the animal agriculture industry. Um, I think you could certainly make the argument that the animals raised for food live a significantly worse life than Cecil did because, uh, Cecil got to live out his natural, you know, quote unquote natural life for, his entire lifespan with the exception of those last 40 hours. Whereas animals that are bred into the food industry are, you know, subjected to an entire lifetime of misery and don't have freedom for even a second. So from that angle, you could certainly say that um, people should be more outraged about what are happening to pigs, chickens, turkeys, cows, fish, uh, and other animals raised for flesh and, and secretions. Yeah. And I think uh, as, as vegans, one of the, the strategies that we kind of have to, um, to use to help non non vegans or non vegetarians now is making it making them realize that these farm animals pigs cows chickens whatever are just as important as lions because I think one of the reasons why people are so outraged is because it, as a lion it's it's not in the United States it's not an animal that we th- that we are okay with killing at to any extent really um, it's it's horrible when even a single lion gets killed and that's kind of what our our culture is whereas it's it's become okay for chickens cows pigs to get killed and um i think we want to try to to make that connection for for non-vegans that it's not okay for any animal to get killed and and this lion is just as important as this cow and this chicken is just as important as this lion and and um and helping people to make that connection because they're so outraged about Cecil will hopefully lead them to be then, then be outraged about the killing of, of farm animals and then hopefully uh, to give up meat and become vegan. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, how we as, you know, advocates for animals handle this situation uh, is super important at this time. Um, you know, I've, you know, fallen, fallen victim to it as well, but the, the impulse to just demonize everyone who has a reaction, uh, you know, who has a negative reaction to the killing of Cecil, but is not vegan. And you just sort of want to yell hypocrite at them. But really, um, you know, the most important thing we can do is be saying, it's awesome that you care about this lion. Like, how can I help you connect the dots to these other animals? And, you know, it's not often that uh, a, an opportunity like that sort of falls in our laps that, you know, captures the outrage of the public and we can use that to our advantage. Um, you know, certainly it's unfortunate that Cecil died and I, I hate to think of uh, his death as an opportunity. Um, but it is, you know, a moment that we can seize to help others make the connection. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would, I like to think about it. Like we're not, we're not, utilizing the death of Cecil but we're utilizing just like the outrage that's that's happening in the in all over the internet right now absolutely um so I think that's uh an example of an appropriate response uh for how to handle this death and I've certainly seen plenty of inappropriate responses as well (laughs) um I think uh for me, uh, I've seen a lot of use of the the hashtag All Lives Matter in relation to Cecil. I don't know if that's something you've seen when <laughs> you're not. when you're uh, going through Facebook, but um, you know, for you know, that is a phrase that, of course, on its surface, seems like a fairly innocent phrase, and um, you know, of course, all lives do matter, um, but unfortunately, it's one that's been used to sort of shut down the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and a lot of uh, vegan advocates I see are now using that, especially in relation to Cecil, because mm. they're trying to get people to make that connection. And whether knowing they're knowingly, they're sort of lending support to 
this movement that's going against another uh, or this phrase that's going against another, you know, radical social justice uh, movement that's happening right now. Uh, and it's a little disappointing to see or it's, it's incredibly disappointing to see. Um, and so hopefully we can uh, help help people realize that that's not necessarily an appropriate response. Yeah, definitely. And and I think that's a, a perfect segue into the other issue I wanted to bring up in relation to Cecil is that um, one other piece of backlash that I've seen on the Internet is that people are saying stuff like it's like, oh, you're only caring about like animals or you're only caring about this specific lion when there are um, black people being killed by police. It's like, why aren't you caring about that? And why aren't you caring about this issue or that issue? It's like you only care about this issue and um the discussion i wanted to have was in relation to that like how do you care how do you appropriately care about multiple issues and and i i don't think that personally i don't think that making posts on facebook like equates to you doing something about um something i think i think exposure um exposing different people to different ideas is very very important but um, writing something on the internet isn't always like the best means of uh, of promoting social issues. Uh, so what I wanted to talk about was was is it is it a bad thing to care about just one issue? Is it a bad thing to to care about two? Is there a such a thing as caring about not caring about? But is there such a thing as as trying to tackle too many issues? Or would your um, like, would you be better or would you be more supportive or more helpful with just putting all your effort into a few issues rather than, I guess, for lack of better words, spreading yourself too thin? What do you think, Andy? Oh, that's a, that's a whole lot of questions right <laughs> there. Um, a lot to unpack for sure. Uh, it's a super complicated issue. Um, I know that, you know, the tendency is... If someone cares about one thing, say vegans, um, people will often say, like, well, you don't care about the people picking your vegetables or something. Um, you know, and I think it's a false premise that you can't care about more than one thing at a time. Um, I thought I was going somewhere good with that. Um <laughs> But, uh, you know, for me, I don't feel like there's ever or f most of the time there's not a time when you have to sacrifice uh, the rights of some to help promote the rights of others. Um, certainly, there are a lot of groups that do that, um, but I don't think that it's necessary. And mm -hmm. certainly, uh, you know, you look at large groups like PETA um, come under fire a lot for using sexism and racism and whatnot to promote their message. Um, and as far as I'm concerned, all that's unnecessary like they don't need to be using that type of messaging um to to promote animal rights like we have a, a strong enough issue a strong enough message on its own that we don't have to prop up against you know uh, other social justice issues we don't have to stand on the heads and necks of of other you know marginalized groups in order to get our message across um so but i understand the tendency to see oh this person really cares about something why don't they care about this other thing? Um, because I get it. It's like as a vegan, when I see a vegetarian, I'm like, you care about animals, and so you've stopped eating their flesh, but you, why don't you care enough about this other thing? And it's like, really, probably I should be more upset at the person that's eating animals, not the person that's not eating animals, mm -hmm. but some of their secretions. But in my head, I'm like, well, you've got there part of the way. So that's why I want to uh, like focus in on you. And so I see that when um, people try and say, well, you care about this lion or you vegans care about these animals, but you don't care about this issue. Um, and it's like, why not attack the general apathetic public instead of this group that's focusing in on this certain one issue? Um, but it's also like, you should get it. You should get it. You've, you've gone vegan. You've learned to examine and, uh, and realize that like everything you've sort of been told growing up, eating animals is normal, necessary, natural, etc. cetera. Um, you've examined that and said, none of that's the case. So you should be able to examine, uh, you know, issues of police violence and go, Oh, they do disproportionately affect people of color. Um, and so that's why, you know, as you know, we're talking about black lives matter is an important thing to be focusing on. Um, so, you know, I, again, just rambled for a while, but I, I hope that sort of, um, 
partially answer some of your question? Yeah, no, I definitely did. And, um, and I definitely wasn't trying to imply that I agree when, when one social justice group uses like the oppression of another, so, uh, another group to further their own means. Like that's definitely, I think that's never acceptable. I don't think that's, and like you said, it's never necessary. It's, it's just completely unnecessary. Um, I guess what I was thinking about, and I don't have an, I don't have an answer to this either. Um, I don't have an answer to a lot of things, but what I was thinking about was, was it it just seems like, um, since I'm a, a relatively young fellow and, and since I've been into issues of social justice, um, whether that be veganism or anything else, it's like the internet has always been, has always been around when I've been in, like, since I've been into these issues. And so uh, internet activism has always kind of been synonymous to me with just like activism. That's always, it's always been there. And I think that the internet, um, is a, is a amazing tool to help to, to aid activists. Um, but I'm just wondering, what am I wondering? I lost my train of thought. I'll edit this part out. Um, well, to, to pick up on that thought, I think there's a lot of debate between slacktivists, clicktivists, armchair activists versus those who actually get out in the field. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of power for someone getting out and physically doing something. But also, you know, there's a lot of research that basically says, like, changing social norms is, like, one of the most important things that we can be doing. So I wouldn't want to discount post on Facebook. Um, I think there's a strategic way to do it. If you're just constantly posting about an issue all the time, you're going to get tuned out. Mm -hmm. I've had plenty of vegan activists add me and then all they do is just post about this horrific thing and this horrific thing and just like vague accusations at people. Um, and that's not effective, but I think if you live your life, uh, and post about your normal things. I went to the movies, I did this, I saw this band. And then you slip in a post about veganism or Cecil the Lion or police brutality. It's a really effective thing because people go, oh, this person doesn't always post about this yeah. stuff. This must be important yeah, for them to post is, about This it. is a normal person <laughs> yeah. that cares a lot about these issues. Yeah, and you know, it's it's a bummer because really what, th- what every single issue that we're talking about and, and certainly men that made it, we will hopefully cover in future episodes, deserve is people just screaming their heads off, you know, 24-7 because these are really horrific things. Um, but what we know about social change is that doing that doesn't, isn't effective. Um, so that's sort of a little bit of a tangent there. Um, but I, I think that, uh, certainly a lot of good can come from Facebook posts and I wouldn't want to discount that. Definitely. And you know what, what I was thinking about before I lost my train of thought before was that, um, cause I was talking about how since I've been into activism, it's like the internet has been always been around. And, um, it, it seems like, especially recently that there's, um, like there's always a really, or there's always a few really big issues that everybody is posting about, and they're usually in relation to like a news story that just happened. So, for instance, Cecil the Lion, and now like everyone is posting about that, um, or like all the recent cases of of um, police murdering people of color, and like a lot of people are posting about those too. And I'm just wondering what how you feel, Andy, about. Um, like, do you think going back to what I was saying about how there's there's hundreds of there's too many issues in the world for ah, there's too many issues in the world for like one person to tackle. So do you think um, because this is kind of how the Internet tends to be is it's kind of like everyone kind of gets pushed towards these few issues. Do you think that we should like while these issues are really big, like put a lot of energy into um I don't know if resolving is the right word or or supporting some issue because you have so much backing. And then like once some progress gets made to that move to a different issue, or do you think we should kind of just like always be um, like working on a bunch of different issues that aren't necessarily like in the spotlight at that moment? Because to me, it almost seems like when these issues are in the spotlight, when these issues are big on the internet, it's easier for change to happen. Absolutely. Uh, that's a really good question. I think that, uh, well, to put it on like a larger scale, you often see legislation passed 
for uh, a certain hot button issue after something big affecting that has just happened. So um, gun reform will happen after a school shooting and stuff like that. So I think it is important to seize on those moments and, and take advantage of them and you know use them to get the general you know sympathy on your side um you know uh but at the same time not lose sight of other issues i think for me personally when i think about um trying to you know keep my eye on intersectional uh politics and issues uh obviously sort of veganism and animal rights is kind of my issue that i work on the most um but i still you know do my best to um, educate myself on other issues that are going on so that I make sure that I'm not treading over those things. For instance, not unknowingly using all lives matter to promote animal rights. Um, so it's like, I think there's a way to have your key issue. I think it's important to have someone focusing on one issue, um, because, you know, some things require more than just a couple hours a week. Some things mm-hmm. require someone working 40, 50, 60 hours a week. And it's important for them to, to have that singular focus, um, but also to make sure that they're not, you know, uh, doing the things we've already been talking about, you know, using the oppression of other humans to promote their issue um, are all important things. So I think, you know, for me, what I think the best thing to do is to, to do what you are working on. Find your issue that speaks to you, that you can maintain momentum for, that you can find a way of, of outreach or activism that is, you know, simple and effective and sustainable that you can keep doing uh, while lending your support when asked of you for other causes. So for instance, you know, I will go out to other protests or demos or something uh, when, you know, my friends who work on those other issues are like, Hey, you should come out to this. It's big. We need numbers in the crowd uh, and lend my support there when I can, but I'm not going home and focusing solely on their issue. Um, Cause I think that's a recipe for, for burnout, you know, even focusing mm-hmm. on one singular issue is a recipe for burnout. So if you're trying to do everything for everyone, I think that it, it's not, sustainable um and it's easy to point fingers at people for not caring enough about certain issues uh, but i guess at the end of the day you know it's frustrating for sure um, but at the end of the day i'm glad people are working on something over nothing yeah yeah i think that was very that was very well put it totally is it's it is frustrating when um when someone like you know should care about something and you're like oh why don't you care about this and maybe they maybe they do care about this and like you said they're just they're focusing a lot of their efforts on something else, and, and that was yeah, that was very well put. Did you uh, did you have any final thoughts on this whole Cecil uh, Cecil topic, or we kind of digressed a little bit? Any last thoughts before we take a break? You know, I feel like we've we've gone through everything that we were trying to hit. I'm sure we missed some points, um, you know, but hopefully, you know, people can email us if they want us to talk further on any topic. Yes, our email is the. Bearded vegans at gmail.com. Freshly made. <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to take a break and we'll be right back with our review of the top five vegan restaurants or vegan options in Connecticut. Yes. Be right back. Hey, everyone. This is Paul of the Bearded Vegans. Thanks so much for listening to our very first episode. Uh, I just wanted to let you know that the Bearded Vegans is part of the Commentist Network, and you can find us on iTunes and Stitcher. And uh, I would encourage you to learn more about the show at thecommentist.com. That's T-H-E-C-O-M-M-E-N-T-I-S-T dot com. Uh, we also have a lot of other great shows on the Commentist Network. I do two other shows. Uh, one of them is called Continuous Improvement. That's just a kind of general positivity podcast and then i do one uh with my brother and some of my other friends called roll to hit which is a dungeons and dragons podcast so yeah please check all those out uh thanks for listening again and let's get back to the show i don't eat no meat no dairy no sweets only right vegetables fresh fruit and whole wheat all right welcome back this is uh the bearded vegans with paul and andy i'm andy i'm paul <laughs> i don't know if we need to do that introduction again <laughs> Cut that out. Uh, so, you know, as a as an introductory episode, we're both from Connecticut, and uh, Paul resides here. I'm about to be on the road and, and sort of be residentless for a while. Um, but as I mentioned, I, I run a vegan clothing company. I go to a lot of veg fest, and uh, Connecticut actually had their first, as far as I'm aware, all vegan event in several years, Compassion.
Passion Fest, which was in Hamden, Connecticut, over the weekend. And Paul was asking me how it was. Uh, and I said, oh, you know, the, the turnout was bigger than we were expecting. And it was certainly a great event. Um, but that I was a little disappointed that some of the great vegan restaurants um, and restaurants with vegan options were not food vendors there. Uh, and there certainly was some really quality food vendors. Hardcore Sweets was there. And uh, they're not all vegan, but they do vegan cupcakes. Uh, and they sold out with, uh, you know, two hours left. So they were very popular. The Sweet Beet was there. And uh, they do a lot of raw foods and gluten-free stuff. And they had a barbecue beet slider. Um, but aside from that, it, you know, there was some really great restaurants that were lacking. Um, and so we figured it'd be fun to talk about, you know, our f- top five, uh, you know, vegan restaurants in Connecticut or restaurants with vegan options. Unfortunately, you know, vegan uh, in Connecticut is not the most prevalent thing. There's certainly tons of really great options, but compared to like an Austin or Portland or something like that, uh, our, you know, it's a little bit of slim pickings. So uh, we each made our own top five list and we're going to go through and just talk a little bit about them and and hopefully inspire you to go check them out if you're ever in the area. Yeah. (laughs) Want me to go first? Sure. Do you have any honorable mentions? Yes, I have two honorable mentions. One is uh, Sweet Claude's. It's an ice cream place from my hometown in Cheshire, Connecticut. And uh, they do a couple, I'm pretty sure they do a couple um, like vegan ice cream options. And I'm pretty sure they make it there, I want to say. Yeah, they, they list it as homemade tofu. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if they were just like, this is what you call vegan ice cream because <laughs> they've been doing it forever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, they make, they make all their own ice cream. Yeah. So it's, it's, um, it's, I, it's kind of like a nostalgia thing for me too, since, it's, since it's in my hometown. So I like to go there every once in a while and get some, some nice, some nice ice cream. It's nice to, to, um, to get ice cream. That's not like the same brands that I get all the times when I go to Whole Foods or something out like of that. a pint. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's nice to go there and get a cup of ice cream and then go sit on the porch yeah. and sort of watch traffic go by and just get the ice cream treat. experience. Yes. Um, and my other honorable mention is the Amore food truck, which I just recently discovered. It's, um, they go around, I they might be based in Hartford. I know they go to the, the greater Hartford area. Uh, but recently they've been outside of Whole Foods every Monday. The Whole Foods that I live near has a kind of farmer's market type thing and um they've been there every monday and they have some great uh they have some great vegan options as well entrees and desserts i had like a it was like a korean barbecue type sandwich and it was it was pretty delicious and I, on their website it makes they do catering and it makes it seem like they can make literally any type of food like any type of cuisine so i'm hoping that um like the next time I see them around, maybe they they'll switch they switch up the menu every once in a while because it it just seems like they are very talented uh, cooks. Ooh, Korean barbecue sandwich sounds really yes. good. Yes, very um, good. Maybe we go back and forth. Like you do your five, I do my five. Okay, something like that. Yeah, um, I'll go through my honorable mentions. Mm-hmm. Um, Delania's in New Haven. Uh, they are a pizza place, and New Haven um, is. Known for pizza, although maybe not necessarily outside of Connecticut, but it's, it's a point of pride that, uh, you know, everyone's like, we did it before New York and stuff. Um, and finally, New Haven got a proper place that does uh, good vegan pizza. The crust is amazing. They have a lot of fun, different toppings. Um, Paul's not as enamored by their crust. <laughs> they, I've, I've gotten it several times and it's been very, very burnt, but... If that's your thing, it's, do you? <laughs> it's part of the, it's part of the charm. Um, so I, I would recommend them wholeheartedly for vegan pizza, uh, and then also Edge of the Woods. It's not a restaurant per se, but um, it's a it's all vegetarian market, and so they have a great selection of you know produce and fun vegan products and the usual things you would expect at like a natural market. But they also have a hot bar, a juice bar, a sandwich bar. Uh, all the bars and a uh, bakery. And I would say the bakery is probably 75% vegan and it's kind of hit or miss in there, but they have really great things like vegan cheese, danishes and blondies. And uh, they make a really great vegan fruit tart with uh, cashew cream as the base. Um, And so those are my two little shout outs to, you know, places that didn't quite make the list, but are certainly worth visiting. Nice. So I'll go through. I'll go through my list first. Uh, my number five is Tali Two in New Haven. 
Um, it's a vegetarian Indian Indian place, and they have a lot of vegan options. One of the things that I'm that like got me really stoked the first time I went there is that instead of instead of the menu saying like, okay, here's all our options, and there'll be a little V next to the 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 items that are vegan. It's here's all our options, and there's a little symbol for the items that are not vegan. So it's just kind of cool to assume like. Everything is vegan unless otherwise specified. I think that's kind of cool. And the name is also really goofy because it's it's there's a restaurant, I think it's in it's near me in Hartford that's called Tali, that's an Indian restaurant, and this is Tali Two, T O O. So it's just like, yeah, this is Tali as well, I guess. <laughs> and it's just a goofy name. There, uh, there's also a Tali in New Haven as well. Oh really? Maybe that's what I'm thinking of then. Yeah. I but I, it, maybe it's a common name. Yeah. Could be too. Uh, my number four is Ion. It's only natural. Um, I'm that maybe on Andy's list as well, but um, that's a that's another that's a good one. Uh, number three is Mia's. That's a sushi place in New Haven. They have uh, it's not it's not vegan or vegetarian, but they have an extensive. Uh, vegan sushi menu. I know it's been written that they have the largest, the world's largest vegetarian sushi menu. I don't believe that, uh, <laughs> but it's still delicious. <laughs> it's it's it's. Uh, I'll talk. Yeah. Mia's did make my list, so I'll talk about. Okay, it more all right, I'll list. let you talk but, about. But um, yeah, I, there's a there's a place called like Vegan Love in somewhere in New Mexico. I want to say Albuquerque, and they have a huge vegan <laughs> sushi menu. So I know they've got Mia's beat, but yeah. uh, Mia's is certainly the best. Yeah, and like all everyone that works at Mia's is also great too. But Andy's going to talk about that in a bit. My number two is Tangiers. That's in uh, West Hartford. I'm, it's on the West Hartford Hartford border. I'm not sure which it's in exactly. It's a Middle Eastern place. It's like a little a tiny little grocery market, and then they also have uh, food and they make my favorite falafel that I've ever had. I get it about once or twice a week. In in all seriousness, I do get it about once or twice a week, and it is delicious. I, I can attest to that. I am <laughs> I'm not I'm a bad vegan. I'm not a huge falafel fan, so I usually don't go out of my way to have it. But uh, we were I, I suggested going to Paul's number one uh, option, but he shot me down and we went to Tangiers instead. And I have to say it was absolutely delicious falafel and probably the best <laughs> I've had as well. Excellent. And my number one is China Pan, which is in Farmington. And that is a it's kind of like this hole in the wall Chinese place. It's in the corner of this. It's kind of hard to find unless you know where it is. And um it's a normal Chinese food place, but then in the middle of the menu, it just has this enormous vegan section that has every vegan uh, fake meat that you could ever, ever want from um, chicken, duck, pheasant, goose. They, goose. They used to have lobster, but I've tried to order it a bunch of times, and they've always said that they don't have it anymore. <laughs> we, someone I used to go with all the time tried to order the scallops, and for years they just kept saying they're out. I think they just stopped getting them, but <laughs> yeah. never changed the menu. Yeah, they also used to have. Um, they also used to have mutton, which I've also tried to. They order don't have that, that anymore. No, I don't think they have that anymore. But um, and yeah, but it's just like tons of tons of different kinds of meat. And then in all of the the more traditional like items that you'd get at a Chinese uh, restaurant, so that place is my my stomach doesn't doesn't always agree with me on this, but uh, I I love it. It's a lot of Meiwa like meat products. So if you're a fan of like Meiwa chicken, you'll love it. They do a fantastic um, General Tso's chicken, mm-hmm. and a lot yeah a lot of very bizarre. Things that, like uh, silver chicken balls, oh, yeah. uh, which used to be a thing I always got. Yeah. Uh, I, the the secret star of that place is the uh, barbecue spare ribs. Oh, oh, yeah. Which you must get if you get there. <laughs> Whatever they do with that sauce, they're nailing it. Yeah, yeah. So that was my top five. Andy, what are yours? All right. So some of their, there's a little bit of overlap. My number five is Ion. It's only natural. I tied it with G Zen because they're both opened by the same person. Although the person, people who run G Zen are no longer associated with Ion. Um, but it's sort of a staple. It's been around for as long as I've been vegan. And, uh, you know, it used to be one of the only places you could go. And if you were going on a fancy date or graduation dinner, whatever it was, that was sort of the place that you went. And, um, you know, the, the biggest star of their menu is their Southern fried tofu, oh, yeah. um, which is kind of bizarre because overall it's a very healthy, organic type place. But then they just have this deep fried, like <laughs> kind of buffalo flavored tofu that is a must get. 
And the last time I went there, they had finally made a plate that was that buffalo tofu, uh, greens, black beans, and like cornbread or something, hmm. like a southern plate, and it was so good. Nice. So uh, they're they're certainly improving. And I just heard from Rachel, who runs Vegan CT, that they got a new chef and new menu and all this stuff. Hmm. So I'm excited to try it at some point. It's not my go-to, but you know, for a nice fancy dinner, it's a good place to go. And it's a good place to bring non-vegans, non-vegetarians too. I think it's just... I, th- I think it's it's one of those places that people aren't kind of scared to go to. Yeah. Yeah, because they do a lot with just vegetables. They don't necessarily have a ton of fake meat stuff, mm-hmm. so it doesn't seem as, like, foreign uh, and scary. So and it's also, you know, it's a, n- a very nice atmosphere, so it's the type of place where I could bring, like, my aunt and uncle, who are not vegan and like to do more fine dining esque you know, type uh, environments, and it's, like, a re- really good place to bring people and show them what... Um, you know, what a vegan meal could be. All right, cool. So my number four is Fire and Spice, and that's in West Hartford. And uh, it's like an ITAL, Jamaican-type place. Uh, You go in, and they usually have 12 or so different dishes that are already made. And it's, you know, ITAL stew, tofu scramble, uh, greens, uh, things of that nature. And uh, it's always great. Um, They're always playing reggae in there, so, you know, speaks to me. And, uh, you know, they never disappoint, and they're a really good place to go and get a a pretty hefty portion of food for a good price. Um, And they have – they don't make their vegan ice cream, but – and I don't know what their vegan ice cream is, where they get it from, but it is one of the best vegan ice creams that I've had. Nice. I don't know if I've tried that. I've had some of the desserts. They also make really good, like, jerk patties, Mm -hmm. uh, which are also delicious. So it's a good place to go and explore. And it's all vegan, too, right? All vegan. 100% vegan. Um, And, yeah, I should mention Ion and Gizen. Gizen is 100% vegan. Ion has some dairy, but they're overall all vegetarian. Yeah. Um, My number three is a little hidden gem in New Haven. Um, I'm from New Haven, so you notice there's a lot of New Haven spots on the list. But uh, Lali Bella, which is an Ethiopian restaurant. And my tip is to go for the lunch buffet. Um, They have... Nine dishes laid out. Six of them are vegan. Ethiopian food is is really great for vegans because um, I forget the exact specifics, but uh, something about the way they prepare food is that they don't use like dairy with like the vegetable dishes. Hmm. Um, so basically, for the most part, all the vegetarian dishes are by default vegan. So it's usually a nice safe bet when you're traveling. Um, and they have this fantastic spicy lentil thing that they do. Um, everything they do is is so great and. And, um, you know, it's a nice place to pop in and the food's all ready for you. So I uh, highly recommend. I usually eat there about once a week. I've never been there, but I should I should go there. It's great. It's uh, it's uh, it's on the same street as the Criterion Movie Theater. And uh, we're not doing a movie review in this episode, <laughs> but I, I go a lot. And, and hopefully we will find some movies worth looking at from a vegan angle at some point. Yeah. So um, I usually make a little trip on Tuesdays, which is the cheap movie day. <laughs> Uh, learning so much about me. Uh, all right. My number two is Mia's, which uh, was on Paul's list. And uh, it's certainly deserving of being high up on any list. I didn't like sushi until I went vegan. And I had run out of places to try in New Haven. And I was going on a date. And I was trying to impress someone. And I asked my friend James, what's left in Connecticut? Uh, or in New Haven. And he said, try Mia's. And uh, their their veggie sushi menu is very extensive, as Paul mentioned. And they have what you would expect from a sushi restaurant, sweet potato roll, asparagus roll, avocado roll. That's usually where it ends for most restaurants, most sushi places. And then they have like another two or three pages that are incredibly creative. Um, they have one of my favorites, which is Kiss the Smiling Piggy, which is um, tempura, sweet potato, mango, chutney, and pine nuts. And um, the Jiji Teriyaki uh, eggplant roll, which has like asparagus, eggplant, avocado. Uh, the whole thing's tempura deep fried, and they drizzle it with a uh, teriyaki sauce. It's amazing. So they, they really just do incredible things with just vegetables. They don't typically rely on any of the vegan meats, mm-hmm. although they did recently add a chicken teriyaki roll with uh, Beyond Meat. And they have a, a, an appetizer that uses the Beyond Meat as well. Which is really good. And they also use um, – because some of their rolls have mayo and they use – do they use just mayo for some – I'm it, not sure what they use. They probably do. But it's – yeah, they use some – they have vegan mayonnaise. So anything that has – that would have mayo in it, you can just get with um, with vegan mayo. 
Which is exciting because um, Bun, who is the owner, who is just the nicest guy mm-hmm. and, um, you know, really has his eye on sustainability. And he goes out and he forages for a lot. Like, they make their own sake and, and neither of us drink. But uh, <laughs> if I did, I would drink his because he makes it. And they have, like, a pine needle one and he goes out and finds the pine needles. Things like that. Um, and uh, I'd been asking him for many times, like, hey, can I just bring in some vegan mayo for you to use? And he wasn't super into it. And, and now I'm really happy that they have it. They started making their own cashew cheese. They make this jalapeno hmm. cashew cheese that's in a bunch of their rolls now. Um, so so it's a very cool place. And, um, you know, they do serve uh, fish, unfortunately. But um, something that is interesting and maybe worth uh, applauding is that they don't serve animals that are typically served at sushi restaurants uh, because of overfishing and stuff like that. So obviously that's not ideal by any stretch, but it is on some level slightly better, I guess. Um, yeah, and, and Bun is, is quite literally the nicest restaurant owner that I've ever come into contact with. Yeah. Um, cool. All right, so wrap it all up. My number one is Shandles, which is in Bridgeport, and that's another Ital restaurant. And uh, it is quite literally Shandles Place. You walk in, and uh, again, there's about 12 different dishes laid out. Shandles, the man behind the counter. I've never seen any other person there. Uh, and we actually, I went there the other day, and it turned out it was his 60th, birth, 60th birthday. And uh, my friend Kyle, who was with me, sort of made a joke about how he shouldn't be working on his birthday. And he said, you know, this is what I love to do. So there's no place I'd rather be. Um, so he, he's a wonderful person, and Shandles has been around forever, as, you know, certainly as long as I've been vegan. It's always been a staple. And you go, and you pay about 10 bucks, and you get six different items i believe and it's just you know enough food for two meals it's delicious i don't know what he does but he (laughs) he works magic on his food and uh you know it's not really a sit-down place there's like a few seats in there so usually you kind of grab it and go um but i feel like that's a place that doesn't get too much love in the vegan connecticut world because it's in bridgeport it's a little out of the way it's not really conveniently located near any highway or anything but um I would heartily recommend that to anyone that's traveling through Connecticut. Yeah, I've never been there, and I live pretty close to Bridgeport, too. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I live like 25 minutes away, and I don't go nearly as often as I would just because mm. it's sort of, you know, a little too out of the way. Yeah. But when I do go, uh, it's always fantastic. Mm. So that wraps up our uh, our top five vegan restaurants and our first podcast. Uh, we'd love to to hear some feedback from you if you have any 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 ideas of how we can improve the podcast or if you just want to say that you um, agree with something or disagree with something we would love to hear from you again our email is thebeardedvegans at gmail.com I like how you kind of sung that (laughs) the bearded vegans (laughs) Um, so yeah yeah, definitely, uh, definitely let us know what you think and thank you so much for listening to our first episode thanks a lot have a wonderful day No sweets, only ripe vegetables, fresh fruit and whole wheat. I'm from the old school, my household smell like soul food, bruh. Curry for la food, barbecue tofu, no. Uh, most prominently featured is a giant neon yellow sign with the let- the words rot in hell posted on the door. <laughs> And uh, the, the dental practice has been shuttered. So that's sort of what's going on with this issue. Um, and I think it's also, it's also important to point out that a lot of this backlash is coming from, from non-vegans or vegetarians as well, which is what makes it, I think, a, a pretty interesting issue. Um, it reminds me of the, the issue with the, also pretty recently with like the dog killings um, and how that kind of, there was a lot of, was that in uh, the, U- the Yulin dog festival? Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and how that as well got a lot of backlash from, from vegans and, and interestingly non vegans. So we kind of just wanted to um, dissect that a little bit about how there's, there's, it's it's obviously a an animal rights issue. It's an animal issue, but it's it's um, a lot of non vegans are taking interest in it. So we wanted to look at that a little bit, and then also uh, another interesting thing that's come in response to the Cecil the Lion issue is that I've also seen a lot of posts on Facebook about then shot him with a gun, and then he was skinned and beheaded. So clearly a, a fairly brutal death for the animal. 
Um, and I think what makes this uh, remarkable and worth talking about is the backlash that uh, Dr. Palmer has received in the wake of uh, the public finding out about this issue. Uh, reading from CNN.com, um, Dr. Palmer has gone into hiding. It appears the internet world was at his doorstep with pitchforks and torches. The website for the dental practice is no longer available online. Online reviews are trashing his business. The hashtag Walter Palmer is being used to pepper him with threats and insults. And the Facebook page called Shame Lion Killer Dr. Walter Palmer and River, River Bluff Dental, which is his uh, dental practice, is 73,000 members strong. Uh, so it's it's been quite a ferocious backlash and uh one of the pictures accompanying this story is a photo of the front door of his dental practice which has a collection of uh stuffed animals uh you know lions tigers uh no bears um <laughs> and uh a, a drawing someone said dr palmer why did you kill cecil and uh Speaking to the to the metals uh yeah so that's a little bit about ourselves um our first issue uh, like we mentioned, is going to be about Cecil the Lion. So, Andy, did you want to give a quick review? That's and it's a it's a pretty it's a pretty hot issue right now. But just in case um, you haven't heard about it, yeah, I, I would imagine it'd be almost impossible to not have heard about it. It's certainly flooding my Facebook feed. I'm sure it's flooding yours as well. Um, obviously, uh, vegans are upset about it, but also the it seems to have captured the attention of the general public uh, in a way that's. Uh, almost unexpected. Um, the rundown is basically um, Cecil the Lion uh, was recently killed by Dr. Walter Palmer, who is a dentist from Minnesota, and uh, he is a trophy hunter, has a lot of kills under his belt, apparently. And um, it became known that Cecil was sort of lured off of his uh, reserve or nature reserve in Zimbabwe um, and was then, you know, killed by a bow. Uh, bow and arrow from uh, Dr. Palmer and then supposedly uh, lived for about 40 hours while the hunters were tracking him down an activist. Uh, I've toured extensively on the 10 billion lives tour, uh, which is a project of the farm animal rights movement. And uh, more people would probably know me as uh, the face of compassion company, which is uh, an organic USA made vegan clothing line. And I've been running that for about four years. And that takes me all over the country to various veg fest and animal rights conferences and uh, that's pretty much me in a nutshell. My uh, my name is Paul. Uh, my vegan resume is much less uh, extensive uh, than Andy's, but I've been vegan for about six years at this point. Um, I've I've done some some volunteer work. I usually help out Andy sometimes with the Compassion Company stuff at Veg Fests. Um, I've gotten a couple articles published in some uh, Connecticut newspapers about trying meatless Mondays or trying to get uh, more meatless options in schools. I am currently a high school math teacher, uh, so that's why I have the kind of passion about education. And um, I've recently I've helped out with some uh, with the the 10 billion lives tour when uh when we were rocking out at the mayhem fest uh so bringing v i don't eat no meat no dairy no sweets only ripe vegetables fresh fruit and whole wheat from the old school my household smell like soul food bro curry falafel welcome to the very first episode of the bearded vegans my name is paul my name is andy and we are the bearded vegans this is a podcast where we talk about vegan news reviews and have a dissection of other vegan and social justice issues uh for this very first episode we're going to first start out by talking a little bit about ourselves and then we're going to go into uh the issue of cecil the lion that's kind of been a hot issue especially in the vegan community and just in the the general community too i'd say and then we're gonna finish off with a, a little review of our top five uh vegan restaurants in connecticut where we both currently live so yeah let's start off with a little bit about ourselves andy would you like to go first oh sure uh so my name is andy tabar and uh i've been vegan for close to eight years now um, I've, you know, tried my hat as a vegan 